Well, I just love how the town is like completely complacent with their bullying. They're just like, no, oh, you know, that's Biff. Like, uh, no one wants to, no one wants to stand up except for, except for future mayor Gordy Wilson. He's a shitty mayor. He's awful. <laughs> Remember when we first met John McClain? Our guy picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClain. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we love when growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even remember what Blockbuster Video was? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I am one of your three hosts, Roger Roper, and alongside me are my two co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And Gene Lyons. Get your damn hands off her. And each week we take a look back and decide if our favorite films from our childhood still hold up. Each week the audience selects from four movie choices that we then break out our waste car VHS tape rewinders and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes at the end of each podcast. The three of us will provide you with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective bums. So thank you so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, and uh, what, what do we guys uh, listen? I've 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 I don't know where I've been. I've been out uh working i've been traveling i apologize but uh you didn't have your extra uh, you know plutonium to get back i i did it's, I've, I've, it's, I've i've spent so much time building a uh, a mr fusion that uh, that i've forgotten to record podcasts uh what 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 are we doing tonight so the category was uh, 1980s best bully movies cuz you know bullies hot topic and then, you know bullies are fun back in the 80s <laughs> What, did we time travel to 2010 when bullies were a hot topic? Well, I, I think bullying today is still a hot topic, but back then it was <laughs> it was it, it, you could use bullies in a funny way. I think once you know people started killing bullies and bullies started leading to suicides, it changed a little bit. So we had 1995's Friday with Debo because he's going to steal your bike. Uh, all the Mean Girls from Heather's. What was the what was the bully in the Karate Kid? Johnny. Yeah, sweep the leg. Sweep the leg. Yes. No, Johnny was the hero in the Karate Kid. I'll defend that to the, to this day. Uh, I've seen. It was that the karate. It, it, it was it was Johnny's master that was the bully. No, it was Ralph Macchio. He's he no, was okay. the aggressor. Well, he he too. He yeah, too. I'll, right. I'll put a link to the video. There's proof of it. But the winner, the epic 1995 Back to the Future, and it's bully Biff Tannen. Ah. <sighs> I got to say right off the bat that I was I was really disappointed in the voting on this one where I thought like Biff like really and after watching it this time oh, I'm 100% hats off to the voters for remembering what an amazing bully this guy is. Forget about bully, he he's potentially a rapist. Yeah, well it's it's <laughs> I think we're talking about stuff that we applauded Spo- Big D. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Well, you're okay, you're, not, you're applauding the fucking war crime here. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, the, the great thing, the, the, the funny thing about that is the actor who plays Biff, uh, Tannen, he's a remarkable character actor and has consistently been known as the nicest guy to ever work with. And it's just funny to see him play such a, a terrible and be an iconic bully that you remember. And it just be like the nicest guy ever. It, it's like, uh, interviews with, um, who's the actor? Gosh, uh, uh, from Breaking Bad. Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston, that guy's like the best dude in the world. But when he like when he turns it on and becomes Walter White, like it's it's indistinguishable. Do the nicest guys can they play the biggest bullies? I just feel in order to shine, uh, Brian Cranston just needs a role where he's just like kind of a happy-go-lucky, bumbling dad uh, to like uh, some kid who's just like a middle child. I think that would really be the, <laughs> the the real ideal role for him to really shine as as who he really is. Yeah, but you were bullied as a kid. Big D, I wasn't bullied. Where did you get that from? <laughs> you weren't bullied. I thought you were. I thought you were bullied as a kid. You, you said you had a lot of oh. anger issues growing up. Who is the giant child that's going to bully him? Like, but he's that, like that's what, but listen, bu- like giants in like in Florida where I grew up, uh, amongst the swamp people, the tall ones like were the ones that were like the gentle giants because they were always being picked on because all like the little kids, the little bastards, they would pick on like, you know, the bigger kids, the ones that were a little taller, had a little bit more weight or girth onto them. I just, I got a mental image of Big D, like one, one at the battle of the bastards, (laughs) just swiping helplessly at spears that are being pointed at him. 
Yeah. No. I. So. So you never experienced any kind of bullying. Were you a bully? Uh, no. I, I did have a, a small bullying issue when I was very young, but I was being bullied by a group of kids that was much older. A nice thing about being a bigger guy, generally people don't fuck with you. Right. So the ones you got to worry about are the little, the little mousy ones who hang around mm. with the big guys because they yeah. try to provoke things, and then you end up fighting to protect them, and it's, it's better just to relax. Right. How about you, uh, Gene? Were you were you a bully, or did you get bullied? I mean, it, it might be surprising because I was, uh, you know, a goth kid growing up. I was an ROTC. Uh, I was a Middle Easterner in the '80s in America. Like you'd think I would have gotten. I, I deserved to get way more shit than I did. Uh, somehow, people were just like really nice to me. But I took it upon myself to correct injustices around me. So I rushed to the aid of many a person who was being bullied. Which led to me getting kind of a reputation as a, as a, as a scrapper, and so I think people left me alone because I was in fights all the time. They were just like they didn't need the headache, you know, of dealing with me. I had a very very short fuse as a kid. Surprising, I know, because I'm so even tempered now. <laughs> I think there was an entire year of elementary school where I cried every day to teachers because I got bullied so often. I was a smart fat kid with glasses uh, that that made straight A's and won spelling bees. So yeah, I'm sure crying to the teachers really helped your your middle school rep. I'm like, can, can we take this to the teacher's lounge? I don't really need to be crying in front of a set of peers that are bullying me for the same reason. So, uh, so I had to develop a sense of humor. I had, you know, I, uh, we all know I can't fight unless it's a, you know, a pushing fight. So I had to develop a, a, a way to, to uh, deflect. And, uh, and that usually came in the form of self-deprecating humor. I know it's hard to believe. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, what movie are we doing again? Karate Kid? <laughs> Heathers. Heathers, <laughs> that's right. All right, Back to the Future is a 1985 science fiction adventure comedy film directed by Robert Zemeckis and written by Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale. It stars Michael J. Fox as teenager Marty McFly, who is sent back to 1955, where he meets his future parents in high school and accidentally becomes his mother's romantic interest. Christopher Lloyd plays the eccentric Dr. Emmett Doc Brown, Marty's friend who helps him repair the damage uh, to history by helping Marty cause his parents to fall in love. Marty and Doc must also find a way to return Marty to 1985. It also stars Leah Thompson, Crispin Glover, and Thomas F. Wilson. It was the number Number one box office movie for 1985 on a budget of 19 million. It made a worldwide box office of three hundred and eighty one million dollars, just over three hundred and eighty one million dollars. It was nominated for four Oscars, including original song, The Power of Love and one for sound editing and spawned two sequels, a cartoon series and lots and lots of cosplay costumes, including uh, a very successful uh, cartoon show right now called Rick and Morty um, and the series overall almost made a billion dollars unadjusted for this guys. We always start off with where were you uh, when this movie, I, I where, what was your first memory of back to the future? So in my hometown, it was a uh, movie theater that had four screens. There was two up top, two in the bottom. I can remember this was playing in the bottom left theater. That's how much of an impact it made on me. I had always loved time travel movies you know, Terminator, Star Trek Four, even the bad ones like Philadelphia Experiment, Final Countdown, uh, My Science Project, another bad high school time travel one. But probably my favorite, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this, uh, Time Rider, The Adventures of Lynn Swan. The guy on the motorcycle, he's driving through the desert. He accidentally goes through a time portal. They're doing experiments. He ends up in the Old West on his dirt bike. One of my favorite movies growing up, It's Awful Now, so Back to the Future was right up my alley. Saw it, I think, one of the first weeks it was out. Came back the next day, snuck in, watched it again. I can still remember the feeling of sitting there as the credits roll. Uh, great memory as a kid, and it still holds up today. I, I defy anyone to challenge uh, Big D on his time travel fandom. That's that's insane. <laughs> I don't, the only, the only Lynn we, Swan I know was a Pittsburgh Steeler. Like, that's, that's right. Like, the only the <laughs> The only time writer I saw was in my dad's movie collection where he told me not to go to, and I had to wait till he had to leave the house. And listen, the, the time portal that, that he entered did not take him to the Wild Wild West, I'll tell you that much. So I, I surprisingly didn't see Back to the Future in the theaters. I wish I had, but I made, more than made up for it on VHS. So this movie was my first exposure to the concept of time travel, and it made my six-year-old head spin, like the possibilities of it. And I think that all of us had that first day when you just sat there and went, fuck, like... Wait, this means, and then what means? I mean, I was still thinking about, you know, the Johnny B. Good scene. I'm thinking about, like, wait a second. Does that mean that 
Chuck Berry learn the song from Marty? Or did Marty get it from Chuck Berry? How the hell does that work? Like, still to this day, like, I, I, I never spend more than 45 seconds thinking about time travel or else I start to feel sick. I don't know if I remember watching this movie in theaters or not, but I certainly remember watching it multiple times on HBO. I think it was one of my first VHS tapes, uh, and it remains to be one of my favorite films. In fact, um, I know for certain that I was in the theaters on opening weekends during the sequels. I was obsessed with it. Also, growing up in Florida, you, when Universal Studios first opened, that was like the main attraction ride. All the kids would talk about, uh, they were like, fuck Disney, have you have you been on Back to the Future? Like it's it, it's such a not only an iconic movie, but like when in the world of theme park rides, like it set the standard for like the new motion capture 3D immersive that you know every ride is now at a theater. It's it's a shame. It's a goddamn shame that Universal Studios Florida replaced it with The Simpsons but still has men in black. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that ride also set the, uh, the tone for children's concussions. (laughs) Yeah. That, that thing was, uh, you know, groundbreaking, but you also, if you sat in the back row, the Delorean, your head just slammed against the side of the ride. I mean, they actually made it strikingly accurate because Marty does say, like, watch the re-entry. It's a little bumpy. So, I mean, I think they're, they were trying to keep that in. They actually they spent a lot of time engineering that that facet of the ride. Yeah, yeah. And it had the same reliability as the original DeLorean. It broke down. The, I, think, I think it was between that and Jaws. And you're like, uh, what do you want to do? You want to go fucking do E.T. again? All right. But anyway, uh, if you've never uh, listened to uh, Shat the Movies before, we are going to play the trailer for you now, and then we're going to talk about the movie. Uh, so if you haven't seen the movie, now's the time to press pause and then come back and listen to it. You'll get much more out of this because we are going to spoil the shit out of this movie. Big D, play the trailer. Steven Spielberg presents Back to the Future, a Robert Zemeckis film. Marty leads an ordinary life. No McFly ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley. Yeah, well, history is going to change. And 1985 is not his year. But Dr. Brown is about to change all that. Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? He's sending Marty 30 years back in time. It works! It's a flying saucer from outer space! Now, he's trapped in the past. This has got to be a dream. About to meet... Chocolate. ...his future father. He's a baby. Tough. Wow! And he's making an impression on his mother. He's an absolute dream. And he can sleep in my room. Ah. Anything you do could have serious repercussions on future events. Ah. Now, he's got to make his mother and father fall in love. For crying out loud, I haven't even been born yet. And only Dr. Brown... Ooh can help him get back to the future. Are you telling me that this sucker is nuclear? Precisely. Michael J. Fox. Whoa, this is heavy. Christopher Lloyd. There's that word again, heavy. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? Back to the future. All right, teenager Marty McFly is an aspiring musician dating his girlfriend Jennifer Parker in Hill Valley, California. His nerdy father George is bullied by his supervisor Biff Tannen, while his mother Lorraine is an overweight, depressed alcoholic. On October 26, 1985, Marty meets his scientist friend Dr. Emmett Brown in the Twin Pines parking mall where Doc unveils a time machine built from a modified DeLorean powered by plutonium stolen from Libyan terrorists. Doc demonstrates time navigation system by punching in the date November 5th, 1955, the day he invented time travel. A moment later, the Libyans arrive and shoot Doc. Meanwhile, Marty escapes into the DeLorean, but inadvertently activates the time machine and arrives in 1955, but without enough plutonium to return. So watching this now as a, a parent, it's a bit odd. If my 16-year-old son told me, hey, you know, I've made a new friend. Oh, tell me about your friend. Yeah, he's a 65-year-old man. He lives alone in an industrial area. He likes to collect cuckoo clocks. He has press clippings on the wall. He, uh, you know, theoretically burned his house down, lost his family fortune. I'm going to go hang out with him at the mall at 1 a.m. This might raise red flags. 
this is this is how you choose to open this masterpiece <laughs> of a movie. You're not talking about how amazing that logo is and how when the back in time the song comes on, you're just like, holy fucking shit, this is awesome. The amazing Rube Goldberg machine with all the robotics. Like this is 1985 and they're showing us the future. This is the vision of the future. I gotta remind you that in the same year, a little movie called Rambo First Blood Part Two came out, and they're like, It's the future. It was a bunch of blinking lights on a wall. And then you had this. But beyond that is like talk about those loops and time it makes perfect sense because marty's already met doc doc wants to hang out with him and also the parents are kind of in on it too now they've, they've seen fucking marty when they were teenagers like it, it all makes sense uh, but the, it wait, all makes no, sense. No, hold, on, hold on here no i think it's more like uh, it, i will make the argument that this movie has probably one of the most perfect hollywood scripts big budget films of all time because the attention to detail that they do from a uh, expository kind of explaining, they don't knock you over the head, the audience, with why Marty and Doc have this relationship. They just kind of do, but you believe it, and you kind of trust Doc because if you notice, and there are things that I that I picked up on this watching because I think you know now I'm an advanced film watcher, but look at I know <laughs> like <laughs> by advanced I mean like I'm on my yellow belt, but the the uh, it, it, like, all the news clippings. The Brown family was a like 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 a pillar in the community, so it would make sense that you know this would be a trusting family. This is the this is the family that sold their acreage and their lots to Hill Valley. Yeah, and I feel like the the movie's telling you a lot here though because you've got Marty shows up at Doc's house before school, showing he's not a slacker. Like the kid's an overachiever. <laughs> I he's very- I agree. He's hanging out with a scientist. He's the original STEM student. And so that's exactly it, is that is that he's not your average kid. He is the coolest motherfucker <laughs> that ever lived. Like he's got the cool Nike shoes, he's got that skateboard, the jeans, that voice when he when he when he breaks the uh the, the amp with the guitar, like everything about this guy is amazing. And it makes sense that he's hanging out with the only other cool dude in town, which is Doc Brown. Uh, I will admit that I did after this movie want to, you know, learn how to really become a good skateboarder. That failed miserably. Oh yeah. And again, yeah, I, I was a chunky little kid, a skateboard and doing ollies. Just and physics wasn't your friend. No, I, I got the skateboard, but, you know, I dreamed about getting towed behind cars. I also wanted to learn the guitar, but neither one of them happened. But yes, as much as the relationship's strange, Marty was a cool fucking kid. Yeah, yeah. And and again, this I, I, the movie does an effective job of showing why he might want to go over to a garage it's it's a place where he could play guitar really really loud uh doc has fashioned you know probably some advanced stereo phonics specifically for his buddy marty uh and you know he's he's going on adventures with his buddy doc like again rick and morty is this movie right like that's the 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 crazy you know interdimensional you know this is probably his world r 144 but i want to correct you on one thing okay the press clippings yeah doc brown didn't sell the family acreage you know, to, to make money. He burned the mansion down with one of his experiments, almost bankrupt the family, and then had to sell it off. So in town, he's not, uh, you know, this great entrepreneur. He's the crazy whacked out dude who wears giant metal things on his head and burns the family house down. Okay, well, then that makes the movie even more brilliant because they show like here here was this great, you know, uh, you know, mansion with the, the garage. Uh, and now only there's the garage portion and it's next to a Burger King. Like, you know, like it kind of is showing like, you know, <laughs> visually without, you know, Marty and Doc having a conversation about, well, back in 19. 19- 55 i i blew up the mansion and i had to sell out you know what i mean like it's it's doing that visually which isn't insulting to an audience right and like raj said again going to that Mick, rick and morty thing is that is that that sets up so many callbacks where you see it start out in the garage and then when you go back to 1955 he's in the house you see this huge like opulent home and then but what does he do he runs from marty and goes into that garage it gives you that like shift it shows you the shift in in the character and you see that subtle information again in these beautifully injected bites the family histories the clock tower with like save the clock tower the callbacks there they set up the entire movie in like the first 10 minutes none of it feels forced marty's obsession with that sexy as fuck like oh. black toyota pickup like all of it comes back it all comes full circle it's so beautifully done i've never seen anything like this and and i, I don't know if we ever will again well, you have, and and that's because this movie has been copied multiple times. And I'll give you a couple of examples I wrote down. Pee Wee's Big Adventure. 
with the whole like opening clock scene and it's kind of doing making all of his toast and he's like, huh? you know, like doing all of that thing that's lifted directly from this movie. Uh, but also Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of Crystal Skull, like the only good portion of that movie is the first 30 minutes when it's he and Shia LaBeouf in the diner and the whole escape scene. That's Marty and Biff, you know, chasing each other around town square. So this movie is so iconic because it's been copied multiple times and you made it not just have realized it. So uh, one of the things I like, we always think of the eighties as campy movies as, uh, you know, today the, the movies are, they're more realistic, but if you imagine they made this movie today, Marty wouldn't just, cause Marty looks like he's an adequate skateboarder. You know, he's not Tony Hawk. If you made this movie today, he would be doing like some serious like triple X extreme right. moves, you know, up on the wall. It'd be crazy. It was nice that they made Marty this believable teenager. And I think that's why everybody could relate to him. He was just a regular kid. Yeah. The coolest thing he did from a skateboarding perspective is, is I don't know, 1955, just knock that whatever thing was over. Like that's that's the training wheels of skateboards. That's that's the only thing that I could do. I could. Well, all my other friends were, were skateboarding as a kid. I, I was the one on the wheelie. It was like a shittier version of Razor. It was like the Razor with big wheels, like off terrain tires. Like a two, it was like two small bicycle wheels. Yeah, two small bicycles. That's what I had. And you and you wonder <laughs> why, why you I got had. bullied? I, I have no idea why. This movie truly is iconic. But what makes it even more iconic is the fact that this movie was shut down and famously took a lead actor, Eric Stoltz, and replaced it with Michael J. Fox. And, and the reason was, is uh, they, they said, while, while looking back at the dailies, the movie had no heart. It wasn't coming across as kind of funny. It was coming across more dark. To answer your question, Big D, I think if they were to make this movie today, it would be a much darker film. Now, Back to the Future 2 is a little bit dark, like most you know, in, in an effective trilogy, usually the second one is. But have you ever looked at any of the um, behind the scenes or any of the dailies? I think they have it on the special features. Well, yeah, Eric Stoltz appears actually in a couple frames in the diner scene. You can see him. But yeah, I think it was a bold move four weeks into filming. And it cost them three million dollars to go back and reshoot. Uh, but the darkness in the movie wasn't just by Eric Stoltz. There was actually... A, a part of Marty that he was partially suicidal, that there might have been some drug addiction. It was a darker, darker movie. So yeah, Eric Stoltz wasn't working, but you can't do this movie where Marty's suicidal. It, it really wouldn't resonate as well as it does. Well, yeah, you talk about the darkness, the Libyan terrorists and the doc stealing the plutonium. I, I felt like that could have been a darker, like the first part of this movie, the first act of this movie is kind of dark. Yeah, it does open up on this on this uh, a very sad storyline from the get go. Is that you know this uh, Doc gets killed? Uh, you know Marty uh, uh, you know leaves his home just on the night that he you know thought that he was going to have this this date uh, <laughs> with Jennifer, and you got George McFly getting the shit bullied out of him by Biff. Like things are not going well in in Hill Valley uh, for the McFlies, and so it, and, and especially for the Browns. Um, but you know, it is, it is kind of a, a real downer from the get go. And, and again, uh, credit to the movie, it makes us really, really care. I mean, I cared about Marty from like, I can't, I don't know how they did it. Like within the first couple of minutes, I was like, man, I, I just really love this kid. And I want everything to work out for him, which is not an instinct that I normally have. Can you remember the first time that you saw the, the box truck, the back open, the smoke and the DeLorean roll out? Watching that sitting on the couch, I got goosebumps. Yeah. The reveal, I've seen it probably 30 times and it is still as effective today. Yeah. I mean, people think that I hit puberty early because I was, because I'm Persian, but it's actually just because I saw this scene. I immediately sprouted a small mustache and got my first erection, like just watching the DeLorean back out of there. There is no cooler looking car. I, maybe, maybe the 60s Batmobile, which I know you guys both love dearly, but the DeLorean is, is it's fucking sweet. So you're telling me that a Ford Mustang wouldn't have been as uh, <laughs> iconic as this? What was it? Wasn't that the original car? Yeah, one of those '80s yes. hatchback Mustangs. Yeah, yeah. Th this movie, you know, the brand tie-ins go throughout it. Whether it's Pepsi, whether it's Nike, but yeah, Ford came to them and they said, "You know, we'll pay you a lot. You have a Ford Mustang." And Bob Gale, who was the uh, the screenwriter, said, "Fuck no." <laughs> I think, well, let me let me find his exact quote. He he said, "No, no, no. Doc Brown doesn't drive a fucking Mustang. Yeah, it's got to be a DeLorean. That's awesome. So, so he got it. Yeah. Well, are there any other movies that you can imagine 
replacing a lead actor like four weeks into shooting and it would have been a better movie <laughs> fucking highlander <laughs> get yeah, anybody who speaks english or, or sean connery would you replace conscious because you know sean connery was just like i'm wearing whatever the fuck i want in this movie well you know like earrings and red flamenco suits <laughs> don't care i'm egyptian spanish uh any 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 uh new star wars film uh i think jake lloyd could have been replaced i think anakin Skywalker, uh both of them they could have been replaced it would have been a far superior movie uh but also who's your favorite time traveling doctor we talked about time traveling movies but like time traveling doctors is kind of a trope who's your favorite i mean i'm gonna alienate a lot of the audience and say i don't know who my favorite time i mean i guess it'd be doc brown but i i cannot stand doctor who i think it's one of the worst shows i've ever seen and it's one of the perils of going to anything that involves cosplay because you invariably have Doctor Who's. And also, just as a plea to the listening audience, stop it with the Sonic Screwdriver merch. Not everything is a Sonic Screwdriver, for fuck's sake. Sonic Screwdriver, toothbrush, pencils, pen, like, fuck off. What are you Dildo. talking about? Do- Doctor Who. Oh, it's well, Sonic Screw. It, it, uh. that, it's his main, it's his tool that does basically everything. I, I think it's it's actually a writing term now. It's called the electric screwdriver, or when you can't get out of anything or you need something to do something, you call it the electric screwdriver. Yeah, all you douchebags who are still saying deus ex machina, stop it. It's electric <laughs> screwdrivers. Also, uh, if you want to know what to get Big D for Christmas, yeah, you no. really like Sonic <laughs> Screwdriver or anything. Uh, never seen an episode, have no interest in seeing them. Uh, <laughs> The other get you a TARDIS shower uh, shower curtain. It's gonna be amazing. I'm gonna get you a Dalek so you can put it on your on your desk and you can hit its head and it go exterminate, exterminate. He has no <laughs> fucking idea what you're talking about. <laughs> no, I have no idea. So Roger, why don't you tell us who your favorite doctor is? Yeah, uh, it's definitely Rick. Like I love Doc Brown. Don't get me wrong. Like I've cosplayed Doc Brown. I think he's great. Uh, but I love I love Rick, and I'm afraid that too many people are gonna like Rick. Um, I'm gonna have to go back to Doc Brown. But yeah, right now it's 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 Rick. He's going to become too commercial for you. Well, I think yeah. Oh, Rick is totally coming too commercial. Like you know, go to Spirit Halloween shops. Like it's all Rick and Morty costumes now. It's you know, I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little gene on this. Yeah, I, I mean, I was talking with King B about this. It's like as much as I want to to get into the show and understand it as as far as Rick Rick and Morty goes, it's the 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 fans have ruined it for mm-hmm. me. The the pickle Rick shirts, the tiny Rick shirts, the the catchphrasing. You guys have turned it into like the new Bazinga, and it's a uh, I can't get behind it. Yeah, but I think the show is making fun of that. Anyway, uh, I do have one tip for Doc Brown: uh, when you're hiding from terrorists and you want to know how they found you. You're driving a giant fucking box truck that says Dr. <laughs> Emmett Brown scientist on the side. You try to go a little uh, more incognito. In 1955, Marty meets and saves a teenager George from an oncoming car and is knocked unconscious. He awakens to find himself tended by an infatuated Lorraine. Marty leaves and tracks down Doc's younger self to help him return in 1985. With no plutonium, Doc explains that the only power source capable of generating the necessary 1.2 gigawatts of electricity for the time machine is a bolt of lightning. Marty shows Doc a flyer from the future that recounts a lightning strike at the town's courthouse. Doc warns Marty not to leave his house or interact with anyone as this could inadvertently change the course of history. Marty realizes that he has already prevented his parents from meeting and it will be erased from existence if he doesn't find a way to introduce George to Lorraine. Doc formulates a plan to harness the power of lightning while Marty sets about introducing his parents, but he antagonizes Biff and the gang in the process. So this gets us to the point of this podcast, the bullying. Yeah, bullies in the 50s, they yeah. didn't fuck around. I think the the key here is, you know, we talk about this the reason why we do this show is is do the movies hold up to what we remember? And in this, I didn't remember how dark these guys are. I mean, Biff is straight up a rapist. They also at one point call the the Marvin Berry band, they they, they call the guy a spook. <laughs> yes. Like I was like, "Holy shit, like these guys I lost my are, shit. These guys are racist, yeah, they, 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 violent they, rapists." <laughs> And I was like, wow, I, I remember them just kind of being like rambunctious a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I thought they were being little rascals, you know, like, uh, you know, driving around their, their drop top uh, convertible for it was that Ford Super Deluxe. But uh, it, it was a little touchy language for 1985. Jesus, they're shaking down poor George in the middle of the malt shop. They're, they're doing this out in the open. They're taking money from him. They don't just want to rough up Marty. They try to run him over with the car. They're throwing bottles at Marty. As a kid, I remember thinking, ha ha, these guys are kind of funny bullies. They take it to a new level. Well, I just love how the town is like completely complacent 
with their bullying. They're just like, oh, you know, that's Biff. Like, uh, no one wants to, no one wants to stand up except for, except for future mayor Gordy Wilson. He's a shitty mayor. He's awful. <laughs> We we talked about this. You, you go back to 1985 Hill Valley. There's trash all over the ground. Uh, the porn theater is showing 24 hours of American style orgy. A bunch of businesses are closed. He starts off doing a good job cleaning the mall shop, but he is a shitty, shitty public servant. But what about 1955 Hill Valley? Like I'm watching this, and again, you know, impressionable youth here. I think this started America's you know, love affair, at least in my memory of, of this era of the Johnny Rockets, like fifties, everything's cool. Like currently you couldn't pay me enough to go to like a fifties retro bar, but like <laughs> the old Jackrabbit Slims thing, like this was like, this was a really big thing in, in Americana at the time was this obsession with this era. And like Hill Valley, although not a lot's going on, it seemed like a pretty fucking cool place. Like I wouldn't mind going to hang out there in, in 1955, even though there, I would have been one of two Brown people. It would have been you and you and you and George, yeah, yeah. in the back, yeah, and, and he eventually becomes mayor. So what does it leave me with? <laughs> well, someone's still got to run the shop. You, you're running the jazzer size in 1985. I just be around to make tab and Pepsi free jokes because <laughs> the movie desperately needed them. But man, the one thing from the 50s that I wish we had today was the four like uh, gas station attendants. You pull up, they pump your gas, they clean your windows. I think that'd be cool today. I mean, you can still move to Portland. They still got those. They do? Yeah. It's law. You can, yeah, it's a law. I think in Jersey too, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, there's, there's, there's one place uh, in Scottsdale that still does it, but they charge like $1.50. It's over AJ's Fine Food. You've, you've been there, Gene, right? Like you, you've gone there and you're like, oh, yeah. you get out to like get your gas and they're like, no, sir, I, I've got it. I'm like, ooh, I, I get to pay an extra $1.50 per gallon for this service. Thank you. They don't, they don't even do the things that the old timey, attendance yeah. did you know i feel i feel like in portland they're still doing the we're gonna you know check your tires we're gonna we're gonna open up the hood and do the dipstick thing that you know people used to do i picture today like they'd be giving you the stink guy like they'd be on their phone <laughs> pissed off they're doing it in the 50s it was like hey how can i help you that was a great day thanks for coming <laughs> so my favorite thing about going back to 55 though aside from the town being really cool was the introduction of Crispin Glover as George McFly. Like he is just the most amazing thing. His and what I didn't pick up when I was younger, but I picked up now is from his posture to his voice, you can tell there's like a degree of Marty in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. You can see that there's this striking bit of theater where Crispin Glover is mastering, like he's got that there's a little edge of that cool of that weird. You can see that Marty would be his kid logically, and yet he is totally a different person. He's I, do, I mean, I don't know if you guys agree, no, but to me, no, he I was agree. the most fun thing on the screen. Well, and, and I think there's outwardly, there, there's obvious thing that the movie does to kind of point that Marty is more like his father than he knows, right? The When when he's in the diner and they both kind of, uh, the diner attendant moves away and they're both, you know, got their head on their hand and they both look up when, uh, when Biff walks in and calls, <laughs> my favorite line of the movie, McFly, you Irish bug. That's fantastic. But but other little more nuanced items, like you said, like Crispin Glover kind of matching the body language and the tone, uh, but also the other things like they were both artists at heart, you know, kind of failed, kind of struggling artists. Um, Marty with his band, with George with being an author, liking sci-fi. These are things that Marty learns about his father that he never knew. But even the less obvious ones that you don't pick up on. When we meet, we're introduced to young George. He's in a tree peeping at Lorraine, right? And that's kind of the joke of how they met. And then his, you know, he fell out of the tree and the car hit him. But think about what Marty is doing blatantly in front of Jennifer in 1985. He's checking out the ladies through the windows at the Jazzercise. And then when he's walking through the town square, he looks back and Jennifer like pulls his head back. So they're the same character, which is brilliant. Even when you think of like why they have got to go on a next adventure at the end, it's not because of him, it's his kids. Right. So it, 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 there's this father son underlying, you know, story that I think is really nuanced and, and done very effectively. But would you want to go back in time and see what your parents were like in high school? Yeah, because my dad was fucking super cool. He was so cool that he got sent away to military school. Yeah, my dad was like one of the most popular dudes in Tehran. Uh, he was an award winning architect, and uh, my mom was uh, an absolute angel. I, I think they're actually two people that I would totally want to hang out with. Uh, more so than most people I hang out with today. I'm pretty sure my dad, my younger dad, would make fun of my younger self. Like he'd be, you know, like, you know, well, dipping my head into toilets and stuff, doing no, swirlies. He, 
you have this idealistic image of your parents, just like Marty had a false image of his mom, that she was wholesome and pure and she'd never been in cars with boys. No, Lorraine, Lorraine's a bit thirsty. She, she's craving <laughs> some, she's not the good what? girl. So, so did don't, she, t- she took off his pants, right? Yeah. I don't know why, you know, because- he didn't have any injuries to his legs. <laughs> Dude, she, who cares? Like, you know, people ask, like, you know, Marty says at one scene, at one point in the scene, he's like, did you ever know you had to do something and you didn't know if you go through with it? I would have been like, fuck it. She is smoking <laughs> hot. She's, she's got those this. dimples. She's, I, w- I felt bad for him. I was like, how the hell is he holding out here? Because what? <laughs> Lord. <laughs> well, let me ask you guys this. Like, how many years? Hold on. Hold on. I think this is a logical question. No. How many more years removed from your current age mother would you have to be to sleep with your mom? Well, <laughs> so like, wait. all right, no, think about it. Think about it. Okay. So your mom, my mom is roughly, I think she's 63, 64, right? So if my mom was 18, that's what, uh, do, do the math for me, guys. That's 40. What is that? 46 years, 46, 46 years, yeah. 46 years. Okay. So 46 years ago, if my mom was hot, is, is that, or do I got to go back to like, well, I can't go back to like any, I can't go back to f- cause she'd be 16. But like, all right, eight, yeah, 46. I think that's a good enough time frame to sleep with a parent. No, no, no. You, you think that if you were there, I would hope you would choose differently. The second yeah. she took her top off, it's no longer hot Lorraine. I think my mom, mom had nice breasts when she was 18. I've seen photos. Okay. Have either of you walked in on your parents? Yes. I've had the unfortunate, uh, because my parents were divorced, I've had the unfortunate circumstance of walking into both sets of parents with step parents. So, like, I've walked in on my mom and my stepdad, like, I think when I was 10, and then I walked in on my dad and my stepmom multiple times. In fact, I think there were times when we would camp out on the boat, and I would hear them having sex, like, 20 feet away from me. So, yeah, I listen, I was traumatized. I was an only child. I had no one to share these experiences with. Roger went full Tyrion on the, on the boat. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's one candle burning in the background. Yeah, uh, speaking of sex in front of parents, uh, th- this movie did inspire Hollywood product placements, right? I, I think they did it the best. Yeah, I think it actually fucking works here. Like when he's going up to the, the thing and he's asking for like Pepsi free and then tab, and then he's popping a Coca-Cola bottle. This is the only movie where they actually say Pepsi and Coca-Cola in the same fucking movie. Like you can't go to like restaurants and get Pepsi and Coke, you know, out of the same soda gun. But they fucking did it in Back to the Future. Yeah, Roger Rabbit brought Warner Brothers and Disney together, and uh, Back to the Future brought Coke and Pepsi together. It's uh, they're both uh, hallmark movies. Yeah, but a lot of the product placements happened by accident. When they switched from Stoltz to Michael J. Fox, he showed up on set. They didn't have any sneakers in his size, so Zemeckis said, "What's he wearing? Nikes. Roll with it." And that was how Nike became associated with, with the movie. And the reason they chose Pepsi was because Pepsi, through its history, had changed its logo dozens of times, whereas Coke had stayed the same since almost its inception, and they wanted to be able to show different logos to represent a different time. So that was the only reason they picked these two, but, man, it worked. Because you think of Pepsi, Pepsi Free, Tab, you think of the DeLorean, you think of Nike. So the dollars they spent getting in this movie paid off now, what, 30-something years later? Yeah, well, you know, how pissed would, you know, is John DeLorean that this movie came out after his bankruptcy and failure of his company? Because this would have set his company to the ranks of uh, of General Motors and Ford, or at least, at least a Tesla. No, but I don't think they picked the DeLorean if it was still being made. It was such an eccentric choice for a time machine. You wouldn't have picked a Porsche because they'd be like, oh, it's a Porsche. So the fact that DeLorean had already been you know, arrested, the company fell apart, he was doing a ton of blow, it made a perfect... <laughs> Just yeah. odd choice for a time machine. Well, I, I think like every failed white person movie that they make uh, in the 1980s is based on John DeLorean's life. Like, again, most people don't know the turbulent history. Like, they just remember the DeLorean and they and they think of Back to the Future. But John DeLorean created this company. Like, he was he was kind of a trendsetter. He started this company in like the mid-70s and like the, you know, when 
there there was no Toyota. There was no Honda, right? There there was nothing to compete against the big three in America, and they went like full tilt against him. They wanted him to fail. Like he was he was like a modern day Elon Musk, but he was also like he was also an Elon Musk with a cocaine habit. No, you're right. Like he was he was in a sting. He was part of a sting operation because he, he in order to save his company, he was willing to go into like drug trafficking. He was he was willing to go like partner up with that Pablo Escobar. No, this is not Elon Musk. I was telling Gene before we started recording to show you back in the day. I remember I'd never heard of a DeLorean. So I went to the local library. I pulled out the microfiche and I started studying DeLorean. He was a dirt bag. He based the gull wings off the Mercedes 300 SL. He went to someone's house. Here comes DeLorean. He's well known. He said, hey, can I take your car for a test drive? Ended up taking it back to the shop. They took the car apart and he used part of the engineering schematics to design the DeLorean doors. So yeah, besides a coke habit, he was a thief, a liar. He embezzled. (laughs) This is not Elon Musk. Okay, so he's uh, the Thomas Edison of of car makers. He's he's less Elon Musk and Tesla and he's more, more Thomas Edison. Okay. With, with, a, with a Coke, with, with, a, Coke with, a, with, a, with a nose candy uh, obsession. But, uh, you know, most people don't know that the, the, uh, the DeLorean Motor Company, uh, it's, there still is a company. It's not the original company, but it is located uh, near Houston and supports owners of DeLorean cars. Obviously, there's a large following of people who have DeLoreans. Uh, but they actually still have five authorized franchise dealerships. Uh, one is in Florida. One is in Illinois. One is in California. There's a, a Bellevue, Washington location, and then there's one international location in the Netherlands. So you can actually still buy a DeLorean at a dealership. Um, there's a great documentary we were talking about that. Uh, Back in Time is the uh, is the one where they talk about the movies and the fan obsession. But then there's another one about the DeLoreans, right, Big D? Yeah, it goes through the history of the cars that you see on screen uh, and, and how some of them had been lost and found and restored. I'll put a link in the notes, but it's fascinating to to see what happened to some of these props and where they ended up. Yep, absolutely. Uh, would you ever want like a classic car? Would you ever want a DeLorean? Of course. That's a, you, you, that's a dumb if there was one, if there was one classic car you could own, what would it be? I mean, the DeLorean's the big star of this movie, but that '84 uh, mm. uh, Toyota truck that lifted four by four in black, it was so ahead of its time. Again, of like think I think back in the '80s and when I was looking at other people's cars. It's just the idea that they went with a black pickup and then lifted it like that, and it was a Toyota. That car is is something else. Yeah, that would be the car that I want. Most people want the DeLorean. I, I want that sweet Toyo 4x4. Um, I think Toyota came out with an anniversary version like uh, to celebrate the 30th anniversary. They re-released it. Um, your girlfriend just got a new Toyota truck. How's that going? You like that? Yeah, she's got that Toyota Tacoma in the... Um uh, Inferno Orange, and, yeah. and 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 actually, it's funny enough that I was talking talking to the dealership guy, and I was talking about Back to the Future at the time. I was like, "Yeah, my obsession with Toyota trucks started back with Back to the Future." And dude's like twenty five years old; he has no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> you should have also dropped in Toyota trucks uh, in Terminator. The Terminator Toyota was pretty cool. Oh yeah, that's that's absolutely true. I just wanted to drive off the lot and hit a kid <laughs> and just yell out, "Stella!" Another one of these damn kids jumped in front of my car. That's how old I felt. I was just like. Grandpa, what the hell was Lorraine's last name? Bouvier. I don't know. That doesn't Lorraine matter. Bouvier. Is it really? <laughs> no. I think he just made that up. <laughs> that's, that's from Simpsons. Marge <laughs> Bouvier. <laughs> fucking Roger, Roger's writing school. <laughs> when Lorraine asks Marty to the upcoming school dance, Marty concocts a plan for George to rescue her from feigned inappropriate advances. The plan goes awry when drunken Biff attempts to force himself on Lorraine. George arrives to rescue her from Marty, but finds Biff instead. George knocks out Biff and Lorraine follows George to the dance floor where they kiss, fall in love while Marty plays music with the band. Satisfied that he has secured his future existence, Marty leaves to meet Doc. I don't want to start with anything bad in this block. <laughs> That's it. No, let's... It, 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 listen, the, the, the car scene is jarring. You know, I'm, I was going to let Gene talk about the Johnny B. Good performance because I know he gets excited. So why don't we start okay. with something good and then we'll go to the yeah. to the car scene. All right. So with something right. Johnny B. Good. Yeah. So so again, I talked about how, you know, this is the Chuck Berry classic and it makes you think like, wait, did Chuck Berry get the song from Marty? How did Marty hear it if Chuck Berry never wrote it in the first place? You know, how does it work? But before this movie came out, I didn't know who Chuck Berry was. And that scene where where Marvin Berry holds up the phone, you know, and he says, you know how you're looking for that new sound? Check this out. 
and I think all of us get it. Um, you know, again, generationally, I don't know if a younger generation gets it, but that's you know, it's Mar, it's Chuck Berry's cousin Marvin. I liked that again. They didn't beat you over the head with it, but it was kind of a clever nod. And that song, I know King B and I were obsessed with Chuck Berry as as kids. We'd be doing Maybelline sing-alongs in the car. And I think this might be my favorite scene in the whole movie. Just that that reaction of the Marvin Berry band to the way that Marty's playing. And when he's having that trouble playing, I that really cut me hard, like cut me deep as far as like I realized at that point how much I love Marty, where he's having trouble playing a song because his fictional parents are, you know, are, are not falling in love at the rate that they're supposed to be. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. No, like, Marty, I love you. What are you doing? Oh, oh, geez, Rick. But yeah, I got to be honest. I rewound it and watched that scene like three times. Uh, right when he yeah. finally agrees, hey, see, come on, let's do one more song that cooks. And he turns around. That was maybe what made me want to play the guitar. And to see the crowd kind of like a little unsure at first, but then they get it moving. Is, is the MacGuffin the fact that his family is disappearing in the pictures is that what we're supposed to be worried about throughout the entire thing because if if there's one thing i could nitpick this movie on it's his reaction when he's about to disappear you know what i mean like he's like oh i can't play anymore he looks at his hand and it's it's a little bit old school like cgi and you know it was a little fantastical for a movie supposedly rooted in science fantastic i'm just saying like if there's one thing if there's one thing what the did disappearing you want DeLorean I like, but the, him disappearing, I you know. Do you want him to start bleeding out? What did you want him to do? I don't know what I wanted him to do. It's just I, I get it. It's an effective way to show visually show the audience that if he doesn't finish his mission, he will be the next to disappear. Like why did it had to go in that order? He's the youngest, so you would think that the, the oh no, wait a minute, the oldest would go first and he would go last. But the yeah, other two okay. are already gone. I mean right. out of the photo. Right, but he's the youngest. Okay, so in a time traveling movie, are you? Hold on, I'm trying to. (laughs) Which child would go first? Right, in this movie, supposedly it's it goes oldest because his oldest brother disappears first, then it's his sister, and then he goes last. But wouldn't it? I guess it's yeah because yep yep all right he would be the last. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, from a logical perspective, it's it's totally binary, right? You either exist or you don't. You don't. Right. Like if my parents never, you know, had hot, hot Persian sex, I, it's not like I would just be missing a hand. <laughs> I'm fucking there or I'm not. So it's 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 a bit folly. But again, but how powerful was it, you know? And and yeah. all these heartfelt moments, you know, when he talks about, you know, if you have an eight year old and he sets a, you know sets the rug on fire, like go easy on him. Like I was getting choked up about just how beautifully they they display this bond between the parents and the child and the generation and it was just it's 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 amazing you you figure that this would be a memorable event they remember how biff impacted them meeting but they don't remember marty this would be somebody who'd have an impact you know and she mentions marty that's a nice name but i guess she liked dave better you know because she names her first kid dave (laughs) that's right how would she not remember that and you're talking about time travel listen if if Marty had changed, oh, the, we're gonna get into a flow chart here. No, no, no. If you if <laughs> even changing history a little, Marty's not born. You, that sperm's not gonna hit the egg. It's gonna be completely different kids. Infinite universes, Rick. Infinite universes. But there are little things about the in a less in a less written or a um. What's the word I'm looking for? In a lesser script, the whole band scene and the whole reason that Marty's up on stage would not have been explained. They like movies today. They would just be like, oh, he was already an aspiring musician. He's just up on stage now. Well, yeah, the writing's tight because they establish within the first 30 minutes the skill set that Marty needs to succeed at the end. He can skateboard. He plays the guitar. He's kind of suave and debonair. The girls like him. He's funny. So he he shows all the skills. And, and it's fun to watch this, but you mix in this entertaining fun on stage, but then you also have a, a potential rape going on in the parking lot. The 50s mm. seemed like a dangerous time. He, you know, Lorraine escapes Biff, who's got his hand up her skirt. She's pleading, help, help, help. Then Lorraine gets to the dance floor and that redhead dude comes over pushes George out of the way and starts trying to make out with her. Kind of a dark storyline. makes me wonder what the 50s were like for uh, for women. Must have been bad. 
Listen, there's a there were a lot of people not doing so great in the 1950s. Exactly. Yeah. No. Uh, you know. I think again, this is where you could see that there were elements of a dark movie where Biff's like, "Get lost. This isn't a peep show." And you know, regardless, B- Billy Zane couldn't have even seen through his 3D glasses anyway. Um, I'm not the type of girl. Yeah. Maybe it, you just don't know it. Yeah. Uh, who hasn't Ugh. used that line once or twice? Uh, but yeah, it definitely, I think the reason that it's there is it, it shows the redemption of George and you, like you fucking stand up. Like I stood up on my cla- on my couch and was like, yeah, like it's one of the most effective spin punches. Like when he gets punched and he does that spin up against the car, it's fucking great. Yeah. I think the movie had to take it to that dark a place to, to show what it took to galvanize George, right? He is a bit cowardly. He is a bit of a pushover, but that he knows deep in his heart, like there are certain things that he cannot let stand. And it also, you know, was at that point, I believe that he wasn't doing it for the girl at that point. Like he wasn't doing it to win her over romantically. He was doing it because it was the right fucking thing to do. You also needed us to be okay. As much as Marty's changing history helped the McFlies, it also destroyed Biff Tannen. He went from somebody who was fairly successful to a broken man. You needed to hate him and be okay with that. I see. I disagree because you look in the last scene, and when you see Biff, at first I thought, oh, like you know, he's being taken advantage of. He's still the same Biff. George has just learned how to deal with him. He's he's still trying to pull one over, mm-hmm. and he does seem. If you see the light in his face when he's talking to Marty about the about the truck being waxed up and stuff, he seems to have more of a joy with his life than he does as the bully. So gullible. You're such a rube. If you watch Back to the Future 2, when Biff sees Marty pulling away, he gives this evil glare. He's acting. He played you. Well, Biff is the only character that remembers Marty. His parents don't remember Marty. I mean, I know, listen, we're spoiling Back to the Future 2, but... Yeah, sorry, Big D. I don't have a time machine. I don't know what Back to the Future (laughs) is. I've only seen Back to the Future 1, not 2. Yeah, but this movie flies by so quickly. I was surprised how, like almost done we were with the movie and then there's like it's such a satisfying film that there's still another 30 like uh, 20 or 30 minutes left after you think the movie has ended and you're like oh my god that's right he still has to go back to the future like and it's great and you're like okay i can't wait like it ends on such a high note on both on both sides and there's again there's drama with the the clock tower and and you're like holy shit like they did a, a whole nother third act like i know the second act he the character is redeemed but he still has to escape and there's drama in the third act yeah that tension mounts bit by bit first of all you're like he, you know you know doc sending him back to the same time not thinking about the the libyans and you go oh my god don't send him back to the exact same time he's still going to be in danger and that tension then builds on, you know, again, on, on top of the fact that you've got the, the the storm and things aren't going right with the cable. Are they going to make it in time? And it's such a fine tuned ballet of motion where you got to have the it, you got to link up. The lightning's got to strike. You got to be hitting 88 miles per hour. There's only one shot to do it. And, and again, having seen this movie dozens of times, it was still a very tense moment. And I was very relieved when when uh, things worked out. You know, it would have been a very different movie if it didn't. <laughs> But you talk about it's a two-hour movie. At no point did I look at the clock. It, it felt like it was an hour-long movie. It just moves. The, the plot flows, and the writing was fantastic. And ironically, there's a clock in front of you at pretty much all times. <laughs> yeah, and even, even though, like you said, the clock tower scene at the end, I know that it's going to work. But the whole, damn, damn, damn. And then the the tension of climbing the clock tower and the, the bells going off and whether he's going to connect the wire, it works. It works great even today. And you talk about the attention to detail when, you know, Doc knocks off part of the ledge under the gargoyles. The ledge was there when we first saw the clock tower, but now they've changed history. So when they come back to 1985, that piece of the ledge is gone. You know, is, we can talk about whether you know whether it would how time travel works, but yeah. in the movie they thought of all the little details. In the first scene where Marty goes back in time and he hits one of the pine trees, at uh, what was the guy's name at the pine? You know the guy who has the the, the he wanted to grow pine trees. Uh, John Bouvier. No, shut up. <laughs> it was old man something. So he knocks one of them down. The mall in the first scene was called Twin Pines. When right. he goes back, it's called Lone Pines because he killed one of them. No shit. Oh, shit. That's great. Yeah. I fucking miss that. That's brilliant. Uh. Side note, I'm in, I'm in Boston right now, and uh, they they call it they pronounce it Peabody here, which is fucking mm. weird. Interesting. 
<laughs> so it's old man, old man. So in California, it's old man Peabody. They even got that right. See, if it had been yeah. on the East Coast, Back to the Future, it would have been old man Peabody. Aha. Uh-huh. It's a completely different movie. Mm-hmm. Just, just you know, hey, listen, you had your Twin Pines fact. I got my Peabody fact. <laughs> yeah, but I just, I just want to poke two holes in the movie here. I got to do it. Okay. All One, right. a, a bulletproof vest. <laughs> A bulletproof vest would not stop an AK. Number one, Marty's got a fucking time machine. Why is he only giving himself 10 minutes to go back and stop the terrorist? Marty, how about you go back the day before? Marty Marty doesn't set the time. Doc yes, Brown he does. Sets the time. No. no Ma- Brown, hold on. He, hold on, hold on. He, he resets the time. He, he comes resets back the, the time. time. Marty, yeah. Marty, Doc finds the note in his pocket and says, oh, you know, he rips it up. Marty drives to the line. He says, oh, if I only had more time. And he says, oh, I do have a time machine. And he says, well, I'm going to give myself 10 minutes. But he actually punches in 11 minutes. Still, you're cutting it kind of tight there, right? Why not go back the day before? Maybe a week before. Maybe a year before, but 10 minutes? You, you go back. First of all, he's been waiting a week to get back, so that sucks. And then secondly, if you go back a day before, you run such a chance of running into yourself. And everyone knows that's like the one rule other than in Looper. The one rule that you always obey is that you never run into yourself in yeah. time travel. Yeah, that and you always you always kill Hitler. Baby Hitler. Time cop. If you get two people like they oh, you know, if they occupy the same space, they kind of like blow up. How have we not done time cop on this podcast? The same way we've done zero like, Jean Claude Van Damme movies. It makes zero sense to me. Well, as the storm arrives, uh, Marty re- returns to the clock tower and lightning strikes on cue, sending Marty back to October 1985. He finds that Doc is not dead as he had listened to Marty's warnings and worn a bulletproof vest. Doc takes Marty home and then departs to 2015. Marty awakens the next morning to find his family changed. George is a self-confident, successful author. Lorraine is physically fit and happy. His brother, David, is a successful businessman. His lender works in a boutique and has many boyfriends. And Biff is now uh, an obsequious auto valet? Ob- obsequious? Oh, you're the... What the fuck what? is obsequious auto valet? What Where? is... What does obsequious mean? Dave is a successful businessman. Uh, Biff is... Yeah, a- no, no, but... I just don't know what the word obsequious means. Know. He's an auto detailer. All right. It, it means Marty's sister looks like Fred Arniston. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking yes. wig. Well, as Marty reunites with Jennifer, the DeLorean appears, reappears with Doc dressed in his fu- uh, futuristic outfit, insisting they accompany him to 2015 to fix a problem with their future children. The trio gets inside the DeLorean and disappear. I tear up every time that just that's such a great movie. In a movie that has time travel, to me, the most unbelievable thing is that Linda would have multiple boyfriends. That that girl's not getting multiple boyfriends. L- Linda. Oh, Fred Armisen? Yeah. His sister? <laughs> well, how, about, how how successful of David is he a businessman if he still lives at home with his parents? Not very. Also, if if George is so successful, why does he have why is he still in the same house? Like I get that like Marty's like impressed <laughs> yeah. with the furniture changing. I'm like, you're still in the same fucking house. Like he's really not um I don't know. Yeah. That, that really worked out. Well, when he first came into the living room, my first thought, like, is he looks at the people I didn't recognize him at first. I go, Oh fuck, that's clever. Like he's not in the right ha- he's in the wrong house. That right. would have been fucking funny. Like it's actually down the street where they live now, but uh not the case. Why also didn't the changes that Marty made in the past improve the city overall? Because he still returns back to a pretty decrepit 1985. There's Red the Bum is still sleeping out on the bench. Oh, wait, that's yeah. not Red the Bum. Oh, that is Red the Bum. Yeah, that's the mayor from 1955. No, that's a fan theory. It's been disproven by the original director and writer. However, it is a very, uh, it, it, you know, is it's, it's in the lexicon, but it has been disproven. That is not Red, the former mayor. Prove it. I believe it. Uh, I'll send. I'll put. I'll send a link. We can put I it in our know, thing. There's there's an entire wiki, uh, Back to the Future wiki, that uh, that, that that's pretty well uh, curated. I mean, I, I think in addition, I think they get a lot of the aging process uh, weird too, because like I remember my mom in her 40s, and she still looked you know decent. I think the flies look really old for their for their 40s, <laughs> and also 80s kids. Man, you you put an 80s kid in a suit and he looks like. 50 years old. Like I just think people just look <laughs> old right. in the 80s. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think so. Yeah. Well, they were skinny though. They were skinny. They were thin, but they looked old. But also, does anyone remember the bum, read the bum getting into the DeLorean that that Marty just leaves there open? I thought there was a scene of Red getting into the DeLorean. I feel that too. Right? Yeah. It's like it's I, like a Bearstein Bears. There what what's the 
what's the effect for that called when we remember something collectively as a society, but it actually never happened. What is that called? Collective delusion? No, 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 no. no. There's a collective recollection. Um, Berenstein Bears. Berenstein. Oh, you know what I think? Maybe that's in one of the other two movies. I don't think that it I is. Think it, Biff gets. I it. think it is. Uh, no, no. I feel like the. It's called the Mandela effect. The Mandela effect. No, I feel like the bum gets into it and he drives off in it. I thought that too. Biff steals it from 2015, but I feel like the bum gets in the car. We need to go back and check this out. Yeah. Because I can, maybe it's just a shared memory. Yeah, the Mandela effect. I could swear that happened. Yeah. No, it, I, I, so in the second movie, according to the wiki, the Back to the Future wiki, and I, we haven't seen Back to the Future 2 yet. Maybe we can do that for future probably, or just for fun, because it's fucking great. But I know that he pins the murder on, Biff pins the murder on Red, but I don't remember what? Red. Yeah, he pins the, like, he. I, oh, the murder him, of George. The murder of George on Red. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Because the, the second movie doesn't have George McFly in it, or it doesn't have Crispin Glover in it at all. The second movie, there were some major casting changes uh, throughout the rest of the, the series. Yeah. So the, Jennifer changed because I think her mother became ill. So the actress had to back out. Right. Uh, Crispin Glover got into a, you know, a contract dispute with uh, Zemeckis and said, I'm not doing the second one. So Zemeckis used a lookalike and did makeup to simulate George in the few scenes that he's in the movie, thinking he could circumvent having to. You know, give Crispin what he wanted contractually. Crispin turned around and sued the studio and won a couple million dollars. So it set the precedent that you can't use someone's likeness without them agreeing to the use of it. So I thought that was interesting here. But uh, the end of the movie, another collective memory. I remember the movie ending with coming soon, like part two. Wasn't there something that said like a last title card that almost alluded to part two. I think that was added to the like video release. I think that was at, it, it said to be continued, right? It said to be continued in the font of back to the future. Um, but that was on video releases. It's like what gremlins oh. two did. Like they filmed no two scenes of Hulk Hogan talking back to the, the audience breaking the fourth wall saying you gremlins need to put together back the film. But like in the home release, it was like, the video cassette or some shit like that. Like you were like, Oh, like there's a gremlin in my VCR. Well, I mean, regardless of any to be continued screen thing, it was a ballsy lead into a sequel to begin with, just because the fact that, you know, the movie hasn't come out yet. And it was, it was such a, a, an, a aspirational movie and such a huge undertaking that they had the confidence to really set you up. This wasn't ambiguous about a sequel. Like you knew you were getting a sequel. Do you think so? I don't think that they, I think they teed it up, but I don't believe that there was any intentional, desire to do to do another film i don't think that there was in their minds i don't think that they had back to the future 2 yet now what they did have in mind and this is where again it's a groundbreaking franchise when they filmed part two they simultaneously filmed part three so when you went to the theater you saw a trailer yeah i remember that for back to the future three when you when you were about to watch back to the future two because they had filmed them simultaneously like now, like they're filming the four fucking Avatar sequels yeah, together. Because it's easy contractually. You get the actors all in one place. Lord of the Rings did it, I believe. Right, yeah. Uh, so it makes sense. But didn't Marty and Doc learn something? Did you really need Marty and, and Jennifer, Jennifer really need to go into 2015 to, to deal with their kids? Couldn't he have just come back and given Marty a note saying, hey, uh, you know, here's some directions. Straighten your kids out. I'm going to need to see a flow chart. You don't mess with other. I mean, come on. As a, as a parent, you know you don't mess with other people's kids. It's like it's like when my, it's what, like when I'm what do they become kids. assholes? Yeah, I was just babysit my family, <laughs> and they're like they'll leave their kids with me. I'm like, I don't want this kid because if the kid doesn't listen to me, I have no idea what to do. I just resort to violence immediately. Yeah, I treat children like dogs because that's the only thing that I know that's you know, like I I can equate to. So like, I'll use the same commands for children as I do for my dogs. You buy them squeaky toys buy, and let them I sleep buy. in your crotch? <laughs> That's exactly right. I put them in cages when I leave that. I have to leave the house for more than 30 minutes. Uh, I tell them, eh, 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 like when I want them to stop doing something. Got a parenting tip? Uh, don't send your grandparents pictures of your child in a cage. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jeff, I talked about him once about uh, his, his sex toy Lola. He just got a Great Dane. 
So the, the, they're cage training him right now. So the cage is big enough that a, a, an adult can fit in it. Yeah. So my daughter walked into it, sat in the cage. So I thought it'd be funny to take a picture from the side and send it to my mother. She, grandparents don't find that shit funny. Yeah. I think your daughter was probably consciously protesting the, uh, the barbaric methods by which they breed Great Danes for your friend's enjoyment. Adopt, don't shop. I agree. I have two stray cats. I don't, I don't support it. Yeah. He'll probably listen to this podcast, uh, but there's plenty of animals out there already existing that'll be put to sleep. I would have chosen to, yeah. to go to a pound as well. Adopt, don't shop, and uh, every public space should have relaxation dogs. Well, now's the time of the podcast where we break out our shat meters and we give you our score. Now, if you never listen to the podcast or you need a refresher, Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It's the equivalent of going back to a simpler time when everything was new and innocent, much like 1955 sitcoms where nobody ever ruffled their home suits while visiting their bathrooms. Uh, Five Wipes, on the other hand, is the equivalent of chasing around a punk kid from the future in your drop-top Ford Super Deluxe around town square, only to crash it into the back of a dump truck, causing thousands of pounds of farm manure to fall upon you and your friends' heads. So with that being said, Big D, how many wipes do you give this movie? So normally I come up with a long justification of you know why I think it's this or that. Zero Wipes, that's it. It's a perfect movie. Uh, it was so good that I bought the full HD uh, box set on iTunes. I plan on watching all three again. It doesn't get any better. It held up. I can't believe it's 30-something years. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. I'll probably watch it again this weekend. Zero wipes, no question. Gene. I try to always rate these things based on the context of what was going on at that time. And I just want to point out that only a year passed between this movie and The Last Starfighter. Jesus. I just want you guys to think about Jesus. that. Think about Good The Last God. Starfighter and then think about this movie. It shows you what they were up against. And and again, that that budget was a fraction of the budget that was done, that was used in the same year for Rambo First Blood Part 2. So this movie is incredible in a million ways. It, it could not be better. I can't think of one improvement I would make on this movie. It's zero wipes for me as well. Practical effects. Yeah, uh, yeah this is a trifecta. Zero wipes. Uh, this movie is still to this day inspires um, modern entertainment. It's it's fantastic, and I'm glad that they haven't remade it. I'm glad that they haven't tried to bring back all the actors for a Back to the Future Four. Like I'm just uh, this is this is a sacred piece of Hollywood that I don't want touched ever again. We're ta- we talked about Top Gun. Top Gun is being remade. There's there's a sequel. There's you know in Hollywood everything's all about intellectual property and a built in audience. Leave this Hollywood, leave this alone. Let the fans enjoy going to comic cons dressed as doc and Marty unironically, uh, and, and only for their fun. Do not try to remake this movie. And we have to, we have to have solidarity. If they do make a remake, we have to all boycott it. Don't go. No, it, it would, it would be terrible. You can't, can't improve you it. can't duplicate what this movie did. Nope. It's lightning in a bottle. It's it's lightning on a clock tower is what it is. Um, well, with that being said, that's uh, zero plus zero plus zero divided by three. Gene, what does that give us? And I believe it is. Hold on. I believe that's zero wipes, Raj. That's zero wipes. Big D, where does that fall in the lexicon of Shat the Movie ratings? Uh, we now have three perfect movies at the top. Mm. Pulp Fiction, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Back to the Future. So I mean, just uh, you know, by alphabetical order. No, this is, this is the number one. This is the number one movie of those three. I'll ask you guys, which would you sit down and watch right now? I'd watch all three of them. Gene's gonna back to back. Gene's gonna say Pulp Fiction. Yeah, Pulp Fiction, but only only because I just saw Back to the Future. If I just seen Pulp Fiction, I'd turn around and watch Back to the Future. Okay, if you're flipping through the TV this weekend and one of those three movies is on, which one would you stop and watch? Am I by myself or am I with people? By yourself. Pulp Fiction. Oh, you suck. If I'm with people, I'm doing Back to the Future. I oh yeah, I, in a, yeah. In a I, I, if I'm if I'm around, you know. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, the my girlfriend uh, had never seen Back to the Future. She had never seen it. Ugh. I got to sit there and same I, same. I got to sit there and watch her enjoy Back to the Future for the first time. It was glorious. I also did that with Ghostbusters, and she's like, "Wow, this movie's fucking great." I'm like, "I know." Like, do you get like Rick and Morty now? She's like, I do. This is great. So yeah, yeah. 
Watch if listen if there is someone in your life that has not watched any of those three perfect movies Raiders Pulp Fiction or or uh, Back to the Future may, like just sit there next to them and enjoy it that'll be great anyway um, Zero Wipes perfect movie what do we do next guys it's been a while shout outs we have any shout outs uh, no I just like to point out that uh, Universal Studios needs to pay attention here there's one of those three movies that they did not make a ride out of. And so I really think that it's a golden opportunity for any theme park. Uh, you know, there was a great Indiana Jones ride, a fantastic um, uh, Back to the Future ride. There's still no Pulp Fiction ride. Mm. So if you guys want to get on that, um, th- that might be an idea. What is is this a motorcycle? What is who's this motorcycle? Chopper. <laughs> whose chopper is this? It's Zed's. Who's who's Zed? What what it's portion Zed. of the movie would the Robin Zed? <laughs> It would you would actually just sit in the back after uh, after throwing a boxing match and uh, and and just be driven around town. I think. Yeah, well, there's a whole uh, scene where you're like the visuals are as if you've just uh, injected uh, pure grade heroin and you're uh, driving down Santa Monica Boulevard. There's also a subterranean rape scene, so that's uh, yeah, that's, the, that's towards the end of the ride. But it's in 4D, so it's okay. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we keep jumps on, keep jumping around. Uh, any shout outs do we have any shout outs uh, no I didn't check all right I, no, I, I, what, I don't even know how to access that right now what's, what's up <laughs> next Big D what are we doing next so we're, we're just having a, a a treasure trove of good movies here you're talking about legendary films uh, we got another one next week it was the best of Bill Murray uh, we had Groundhog's Day Ghostbusters Stripes and Kingpin and this was one of our most heavily voted weeks. We had 616 votes. The top two, Ghostbusters and Groundhog's Day, were separated by five votes. Which way do you think it went? Um, Groundhog Day. Gene? Well, I know the answer to this one, so I can't say. <laughs> well, it, it was Ghostbusters. Oh, nice. And so we, we got a legend uh. this week and hopefully a legend next week. Can uh, can we do back to back Bill Murray? Can we because it was so close? Can we do can we do Ghostbusters and Groundhog Day? You know, somebody online suggested that on Twitter, uh, and and that's a possibility. I don't know. Do we do we do that? Maybe we put that out on Twitter and see how people vote. Although it is a kind of time travelly, we just did a time travelly kind of thing, but it was about bullies. So I mean, we could get by on a technicality. I don't know. Both of those movies are fucking great. I can't wait. I have I have a much worse feeling about Ghostbusters than, oh, I do uh, than too. Back to the Future I though. I got a feeling you really? it might not be all we remember. Yeah. Yep. I I'm hope not. I mean, I mean it's it's one of my favorite movies of all time. This might be one of those weeks where we watch something and I'm like, fuck, I really wish I hadn't watched that. Because you talked about special effects, how this was a year removed from Last Starfighter. Ghostbusters was eighty four. I just, in my mind, remember those stop motion like dogs, you know, the Sigourney Weaver turns into, I don't think it's going to look as good as we remember. Yeah, but that's not the point of the original Ghostbusters. The Ghostbusters didn't rely on special effects, unlike this terrible 2016 version where all they did was focus on special effects. They didn't do any of like the heart of the script. Uh, which really was, you know, it's 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 a pair of it, it's a quattro, um, it's a foursome of 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 New York uh, pest exterminators. Only their their pests are ghosts. It's a fucking brilliant movie. I recently watched it, probably probably about six months ago. Uh, it still holds up. So if we're doing Ghostbusters, I'm excited about it because I get to watch it again. Anyway. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're everywhere, including Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram. Just follow at Shat the Movies. We're Facebook. Uh, we're on there still. Shat the Movies podcast. Our website is shatthemovies.com. Email if you have a suggestion, a theme, uh, you want to get involved. Email us, hosts, at shatthemovies.com. If we have anything we've missed or you want to correct us, uh, that's where you do that as well. We're everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by any of those, please be sure to leave a five-star review. That really helps the podcast grow. You can also check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, and Game of Thrones. You can also check out all the information on that website, shadontv.com. On behalf of my co-host, Big D, Dick Ebert, Gene, Jennifer Lyons, I'm Raj, Roger Roper. Be sure to join us next week for our Ghostbusters review. Thanks so much for listening. Take care, good night, and good luck. And with a little